Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for tonight's special webinar is putting the brakes on inflammation. My name is Joanne Iverson. I'm the Director of Client Relations for Avexia Diagnostics and will be host for this evening. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by an exciting returning guest, Dr. Jean Lawrence, who will be our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Lawrence is a nationally recognized speaker on the subject of whole food nutrition and is a certified clinical nutritionist, master herbalist, certified functional medicine practitioner, doctor of naturopathy, doctor of naturopathic medicine, has a PhD in natural medicine, and a diplomat of the American Clinical Board of Nutrition. She has several years of experience with whole food nutrition, herbal nutrition, functional blood work, hormone testing, and hair analysis. She specializes in endocrine disorders and digestive issues. She co-manages patients with several practitioners and offers telehealth visits, as well as for her out-of-state patients. Her functional medicine practice is in Tocoa, Georgia, with her husband, Philip, a chiropractor. Her passion is teaching and training other practitioners, and she brings education, information, and entertainment in a unique style. Dr. Lawrence has been the executive director of the American Clinical Board of Nutrition and is a member of the advisory board of Functional Medicine University. Joining Dr. Lawrence tonight will be Dr. Wayne Sedano, our Director of Clinical Support and Education here at Avexia. Additionally, Dr. Sedano is the Director of Integrative Medicine Education for the College of Integrative Medicine and lectures and teaches internationally. Before we begin, just a bit of housekeeping. We encourage participation. So if you have a question, you may submit your questions in the questions field in the right hand area of the interface. We will answer submitted questions towards the end of the presentation. If your questions are not answered this evening, you will surely receive an answer by email within a day or two. The slides to the presentation are also available to download by clicking the download button in the handout section of the interface. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Lawrence. Well, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me, I hope you're having a wonderful holiday season already. Uh, don't drink too much eggnog, okay? That's probably my best advice. <laughs> I can't even imagine <clears throat> getting sick on eggnog. That would not be a pretty sight. But anyway, we are going to talk about this because this is every single one of your patients that you have seen, are seeing, or will ever see. Everyone on the planet, it seems, has some sort of inflammation. And I love this picture because <laughs> look at the flames in the background. <laughs> That's just great. Isn't that great? <clears throat> okay. So obviously the FDA is not worried about what we're talking about. They're kind of busy. Okay. So we're not trying to take the place of someone who prescribes medication. So I always start with a cartoon, as you know. Yeah, this is for you chiropractors who are listening. <laughs> and you know what's amazing? My husband's been in practice almost 44 years, and he sees that 99% of the time it is the patient's medication that is causing their back issues. So. Yeah, I'm sure you guys see this all the time. And that's why anti-inflammatories are so popular. Everybody's buying them. And of course we have CBD and we have creams and we have all kinds of stuff, sprays and everything anybody can take not to be inflamed. <clears throat> but here's the signs and symptoms of being inflamed. And this goes obviously for acupuncturists too. A lot of them have low back pain. Of course, headaches are signs of inflammation. The joint stiffness, now we're gonna have other reasons for these as we go through this. <clears throat> joint stiffness can be, for example, low vitamin D, okay? Fibromyalgia can be that the person is too acidic and they have high levels of lactic acid or oxalates and that's causing that, but that can come from an underlying mold or yeast infection. They, they can't hold their adjustments. These are the people that come in four times a week, you're tired of seeing their chart. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest, okay? Let's not just make this all fluffy and flowery. Let's be real, because when you're in practice, you've got your patients you love to see, not that we're trying to be respect for persons, but you've got your other patients, you're like, oh, can they please go somewhere else? Can they please go somewhere else? And then anybody who is overweight is gonna be inflamed. And <clears throat> we've all seen people who weigh over 400 to 500 pounds, and 
watching them walk, you just can almost feel what they must be feeling. It's it's really, really sad that they're just massively inflamed. And then of course our chronic patients and then skin issues are signs of inflammation. So <clears throat> the way I describe that to my patients is I'll say your liver has to process obviously everything you're exposed to, but when it gets overloaded like a bathtub, it's full up and nobody's opening the drain, it's gonna spill over and it's gonna come out the skin because the skin is the largest organ that we have. And so when a patient has skin issues, something is causing inflammation it's either a digestive problem it's a food sensitivity okay it's constipation so they're just overloaded it can be hormonal but sometimes a lot of times it's parasites but poor liver and of course the gut we know that the gut is to blame basically for you know everything i think it was to blame for inflation was leaky gut nationwide leaky guts <laughs> Okay, so this is what we tell them to do. This is our normal response that they're inflamed. You need to rest more. Well, who doesn't, okay? Is it always feasible? No, don't overdo it. Well, a lot of people, especially when the seasons are changing, spring, okay? So your yard has been dead for months and, and now it's spring, it's a beautiful spring day. And you think, boy, I'm really going to get out there and I'm going to clean out the this and that and get the gutters done and I'm just going to do everything. And then for three or four days, you can't get out of bed. This is what happens. And of course, CBD oil, right? Stop eating fast food. Now, I've learned with my patients because, you know, I'm still in the trenches with patients. If you tell your patient to stop doing something, they're going to leave your presence and go right over there and do it. Okay, so it's just like telling a kid, don't eat any more M&Ms. And as soon as you turn your back, well, they're over there eating three more packs of M&Ms. Instead, I tried to tell them, let's incorporate something good for you. And then you won't want the bad stuff, which usually is what happens. But you have to change physiology before you change behavior. We have it backwards. We think, okay, if we just tell people not to do this or that, or they go through rehab, don't do that anymore. They're going to leave and do it again. We have to change the physiology with the right nutrients and then the, the uh, behavior will change. It'll be like, you know what? I don't really want sugar anymore. I don't want soft drinks anymore. So that's the way we should approach it. You need to exercise. Now, this is really funny to me. So let's unpack this a second. Have you ever had a patient that is so inflamed, like a fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue patient? I mean, everything hurts. You don't even want to hug this person. You don't want to even shake their hand because everything hurts so much. And the last thing you need to tell them is to exercise because they're going to start to exercise, which is going to produce more lactic acid, which is going to produce more fibromyalgia. They're going to say, I'm not going to do that. They can't exercise. They're too inflamed. So they need to start really, really slowly, like you know, moving the remote button with a finger. That's about as much exercise as they can do. But these do not address why someone is inflamed in the first place. So <clears throat> here's the main causes. Medications are highly inflammatory, especially blood pressure medications that are causing low back pain. That's one of the number one reasons for low back pain is blood pressure medications. Food sensitivities, right? You can't just tell people not to eat gluten. I mean, if you went to Italy, you know, let's all do a road trip and just go to Italy. Let's just plan an event in Italy, a live event, then everybody go over there. <laughs> and then we can all eat all the bread we want and nothing happens. That would be amazing. So also dairy, we know, is causing a lot of inflammation because if you have patients who come in with constant sinus infections, constant mucus production in the lungs, mucus in the stool. Mucus is only produced when there's inflammation. And dairy is one of the most inflammatory foods out there, but people don't wanna give up their cheese. If you've ever watched TV commercials, every other commercial is something with cheese in it, right? And it's all gooey and they're showing it, you know, slow-mo gooey stuff. Everybody's like, oh, I gotta have that. So these other types of food sensitivities, I see eggs a lot in food sensitivity testing, okay? Eggs are, are very inflammatory to some people. And so these things are all driving it. So people don't wanna change what they're eating, but they find that they feel so much better. And if they get off the wagon or, or you know, they just 
get outside their boundaries, okay, get, get off the playground, they're going to have some issues. And it's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. Sometimes the food sensitivities can be because of leaky gut. We know that that can cause or exacerbate food sensitivities. But also, it can be because they don't have enough enzymes to break down certain foods, right? So we know if someone has a problem with green peppers, for example, or peppers, they're, they're high in cellulose, and so you need cellulase to break them down. So sometimes it's simply that. And of course, we know toxins are highly inflammatory and infections, because if you're infected, you're inflamed. And of course, stress, okay? This is why when you're stressed out, things tend to hurt a little bit more. Do you ever notice that? Like, oh, no, I, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm gonna make it to that meeting. I I can't get up at the moment, but I'm, I know I'm gonna make it. And here comes the Tylenol, the Advil, Aleve, everything else. And of course, hormones, right? So if you have too much cortisol, that can cause inflammation from the insulin resistance, but also if the person doesn't have enough hormones, they're gonna, because it, if the adrenals can't make cortisol, that's your homemade prednisone. So if they're not making any, you can't dampen your own inflammation and then here come the steroids. All right, so we know that N NF kappa B is the problem. And here's what it's doing. It's upregulating interleukin-6, which can lead to arthritis, sleep apnea. Ooh, I have a goodie for you. You ready for a clinical pearl within the first few minutes? I hope you are. Guess what helps sleep apnea? And I'm not saying cure, please don't assume that. But I'm telling you really, really helps that is L-carnitine helps sleep apnea. Wow, and snoring. Okay, why? Because it's helping that mitochondria to heal. Isn't that cool? Okay, atherosclerosis. It, it, listen, we don't need any more of that going on. Obesity, chronic pain, migraines, problems with their fats, diabetes, they got a risk of stroke, high blood pressure, their muscles are wasting away from their sugar, infertility, depression, all these things here. Af asthma, osteoporosis, too much testosterone in females, which is leading to what? PCOS. Elevated estrogen in males. What's the reason for that? It's because their testosterone is converting because they have a sugar issue. Loss of chemical tolerance. They can't even walk down the detergent aisle. Suppression of cytochrome P450, which is involved in liver detox, leaky gut again. Immune cell activation and autoimmunity. So what drives this up? This, the, every, what everybody's doing in this country. Stress, diet. Well, not everybody's on chemo, but infection, obesity, and addiction. People are more addicted to sugar, I swear, than anything else. And they just don't want to get rid of it. Well, it's at their own peril, isn't it? And the most we can do is we can be the warning light and say, you're headed to something, you're headed to something, but if they don't veer off the path, that's their choice. We have to get to that point as practitioners where we do our best, we do our level best to educate the patient and to give them the know the, let them know the tools are here. We have the tools to fix this stuff, but it's still up to the patient, isn't it? I tell them, I'm not gonna go home and cook for you, okay? You couldn't afford it. I'm not doing it. I already cook enough at home. I don't, I don't wanna cook for anybody else. I don't wanna go home and, and see what you've got in your cupboard. I, wouldn't it be fun to go in with like a camera crew and you're the food police and you got these bright lights and you go through people's cupboards? Oh my gosh, that'd be funny. That'd be better than hoarders, okay. So it's still up to the patient to decide if they're gonna take the steps to change their own health. That's just, that's just what it is. We know this and we've got to keep helping them but not beating them over the head. If they're not ready, they're not ready. You can't motivate anybody but yourself. So now this is driving the NF kappa B, which is fatigue, depression, not sleeping, uh, neuropathy going on, anxiety, brain issues, delirium. Well, people pay a lot of money for that, don't they? So here's what else it could. Now, why does it drive up cholesterol? Let's let's look at this instead of me just throwing slides at you. Let's think about this a minute. Critical thinking, time for that. Cholesterol is produced in response to inflammation. It just is. Okay, it's anti-inflammatory. So if someone's inflamed, their cholesterol is going to go up. Metabolic syndrome. Okay, because the inflammation drives the cortisol which then drives the insulin resistance. Non-alcoholic fatty liver that they're seeing in 10-year-old children now because of sodas, big surprise there. 
type two diabetes, there's the PCOS, venous stasis disease, where poor circulation is one of the biggest issues in your patients, and that's why they're inflamed. I'm telling you, if you don't feel your patient's hands, not you don't have to feel their feet too, but it, do you shake their hand? Do you feel the temperature of their hand? Do you have an oximeter on your desk? Right? You need to have one. And then they poke their little finger in there and you just shut it on their finger and it tells you their oxygen levels and it tells you their heart rate and all this stuff. But it's going to tell you, are they having some issues? Okay. Gout, which we know uric acid is an antioxidant. So high uric acid means they're burning up antioxidants. <clears throat> Degenerative joint disease. Here's my favorite is connective, mixed connective tissue disease. We don't know what is in the mix, but it must be something. Uh, stress, urinary incontinence. Well, <laughs> stress can cause other kind of incontinence, can't it? <laughs> you guys got that one. And GERD and cardiovascular disease. Because we know now that heart disease is not anything to do with cholesterol. We know that. It's to do with inflammation. And people are eating and drinking and doing what they want. You know, when I travel, I see that people aren't really changing that much. Have you noticed that? They're just going to do what they want. They're not going to care. They want to eat and drink whatever they want. So sometimes this is a hard hurdle to overcome with your patients, but you're going to have a few. You're going to have that handful that are like, tell me the next thing that just came out. Tell me information you learned from a seminar you attended. They, they want to know. Now, this is a protein complex that is controlling transcription of DNA. So it's affecting methylation, isn't it? That's right cytokine production, which are inflammatory proteins, and cell survival. Okay, <clears throat> now, these are regulating gene expression, including innate and adaptive immunity. Now, I was just talking about that this past weekend to a group, and what is the difference between innate and adaptive immunity? Well, I think the immune system is fascinating. It, it, it's not really fun and, you know, chuckling through it, but it's fascinating. So, innate or the Marines on the beach, okay? You get exposed to some kind of bug and the body goes into red alert. Says, okay, okay, all right, let, let's go in there and let's work on this. So the neutrophils are, are called in. So now they're gonna take that bacteria or that virus, or whatever's in the bloodstream, because that's what's gonna tell the immune system something's going on. And it's it doesn't know what it is. It's, it's non-specific at this point. It doesn't know what the, the problem is, but it's gonna attack it. And now it moves into the tissue and it calls on the monocytes that are in the bloodstream. And now they're in the tissue and they become macrophages. So they're going to start to engulf this bacteria or this virus, you know, and then they're going to chew it up and they're going to dump the contents into the lymph for removal. That's how that works. But at this point, they don't know what it is. Well, after a while, if the neutrophils can't figure out what this is and they keep going and keep going and keep going, now they're going to call the lymphocytes. And so now the lymphatics are, are pulled into the picture and the lymphocytes are what are involved in the adaptive immunity. This is a bigger surge of power to the immune system. And now it gets specific and it knows what we're dealing with. Maybe it's E. coli, maybe it's salmonella, maybe it's clostridium. It, it gets very specific at this point. And now you're calling in the T cells, the B cells, the, the killer cell, natural killer cells, that, that's what's going to happen then. Okay, so if you don't handle it in the innate phase, it's going to start to get there longer and the body has to mount a bigger response. And when you have cortisol from inflammation, this drops your immune response. We know this. If you've ever worked too hard, stayed up too late, crammed for exams, whatever you've done, the next day you're like, I'm a dead person. I cannot function. And your immune system to get a scratchy throat, stuffy nose. This is what happens. We know this. Okay. So this is what happens in your immune system. But if the lymph, this is such a big deal for immune problems. If the lymph is clogged, what is going to happen? You're going to have like a backed up sink in your house. And you can't get it going and the disposal doesn't work and you flip the switch, nothing happens. You got to get in there with a snake from Rotor Rooter and you got to clean it out. That's what happens with the lymph when it gets backed up. The body gets very inflamed because what's in the lymph? Gunk, gunk that it's trying to get rid of. Okay. So ask your patients, you must know what your patients are taking 
all the time, okay? What kind of anti-inflammatories are they taking? I, I want to know everything they're taking anyway. Cortisone shots in their knee, in their shoulder, whatever. Prednisone, ibuprofen, naproxen. It, if you read the side effects of these, they're just, oh boy, they're, they're tough. <clears throat> Celebrex, diclofenac, and any NSAIDs, any of them. So the side effects of these are inflammation. Isn't that funny? They're anti-inflammatory. Well, we know antidepressants cause depression. So there you go. And liver damage, blood sugar issues, okay? They're gonna mess everything up. So <clears throat> this is what I tell the patient who is inflamed. You are a kettle of boiling water. You That is your body. The water is boiling. Blah, 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 you're hot, you're inflamed. Everything hurts. And now remember, I'm not anti-medical, but I have to tell you what's going on. You already know what's going on. The rheumatologist is not going to wonder why you're have a kettle of boiling water. Their job is to put the lid on it, but they don't turn the heat off, do they? My job, your job, our jobs. Take the kettle off the burner. Take it off the burner. And then it starts to calm down. But don't just put a lid on it and keep it going. That's not the answer. Everything has to be suppressed in that world. Suppress it, suppress it, suppress it. No, 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 no. Let's get rid of it. Let's find out what's driving it and get rid of it. There you go. Now, <clears throat> these are signs, the first a couple of them, of brain inflammation. Now, I've had people that told me they were a thyroid case. And they were, it's my thyroid, blah, 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 blah. And I'm listening to them during the interview and I'm thinking, this person has brain inflammation. And this is so fun to do with your patients and it scares them, okay? Ask them to count backwards from 100 by sevens and here's what you're gonna see. <laughs> they always are gonna start by saying 100. <laughs> Why don't they just start with 93? No, 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 no. They have to say, okay, 100 and, and they'll start using their fingers. No, you can't use your fingers. Okay, 93, then they sit there, uh, uh, 80, 88, and then I go, eh, like it's a game show. It's really fun. Say, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope, didn't do it. <clears throat> and then they'll say, well, I've always been bad with math. Well, yeah, okay. But people should be able to do this fairly easily. Balance testing. Are you doing balance tests in your office? And one of the best ways to do this is have the patient stand about 15 feet away from you where there's no obstruction between you and them and to hold their arms out to the side and to walk heel to toe for a few steps and they can look down at their feet. That's the first one. Okay, most of them are gonna pass that, but have them go slowly, have somebody near them in case they feel a little unsteady. Now you send them back to the start, start over. Now they're still gonna do heel to toe, arms crossed so the right, hand is on the left shoulder and the left hand's on the right shoulder and that heel to toe again, but they have to look at you. They cannot look down. A lot of people do worse with that. Have them only take a couple of steps to check on that. And then the third one, they go back to the beginning, start over again, same thing, arms across and forming, you know, crisscross, heel to toe, but this time their eyes are closed. Now you have to be very, very careful at this point. You can't just tell them to take a bunch of steps they might not be able to take one step. This is a sign of brain inflammation, okay? They've had a closed head injury or something else is going on, but they've got some issues. Can be blood pressure related, can be adrenal related, but that's an excellent test to show them that something is really going on. Finger to nose test, right? So they just look straight ahead and stick out their hands and can they bring their finger right to their nose without looking, without looking around, okay? That's another wonderful test to do. And if they have memory issues, could be medications, there's a lot of them that cause that, but they'll, these things usually go together. Now, low blood pressure, like I said, usually means low cortisol and they can't dampen their own inflammation. Elevated blood sugar always causes inflammation. Do you ever go to a party or did you, when you were a kid, did you ever eat all of your Halloween candy in one night? Come on, tell the truth now. <laughs> if you did that, you, you were inflamed probably for days after that. And these people can't lose weight even on keto. Now, I hear this a lot. I'm sure you hear this in your patients. Why does this happen? That's because the person cannot burn fat 
for energy. They have a problem. And so they have to actually eat lower fat. They can keep the protein, but they have to lower the fat because we know keto is big time fat, right? So it's bulletproof coffee and big amounts of fat. And some of your patients are like, I can't do this. I can't do it. So have them keep the protein, but cut back on the fats, <clears throat> especially if they've had their gallbladder out. That's this would be a nightmare for them. So inflamed people, this is what they're told. And I've had patients tell me, well, I'm 42 now, I'm getting older. 42? <laughs> no. What's it going to be like when you're 62 or 82 or 102? You know, that's, that's not the reason for it. You can eat whatever you want. There's a pill for that. We know that the uh, marketing department has done an excellent job of certain companies that are telling you, do whatever you want, like Larry the Cable Guys, do whatever you want, eat whatever you want and just take a pill. Well, what a nightmare. And then you don't have any toxins. This is what they're told. You, it, it's just a toxic world, but you shouldn't, it's, it's not mold. It's not chemicals. It, it's not that. They're just poo, it's just poo pooed. And then you haven't had an infection because you can still be inflamed after the infection resolves, by the way. And then everybody's jumping on adrenal support like it's going out of style. Yeah. Not always the reason. And of course, exercise more. No, 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 no. How about, and you know what's helpful to these people though is water aerobics. There's, it's just the gentlest thing you can do. Okay. That's excellent for people that hurt. Now, I know of some doctors that say everybody's getting a cleanse first visit. Not me. I don't probably put 10 people a year on a cleanse. You're thinking, gosh, that uh, I think your patients need it more than that. Well, let's think this about this a minute. What if they're not going to the bathroom every day? And now you put them on a detox and the dumpster has been opened. Okay. Boom. All this junk is coming into the bloodstream. They're like, oh, I feel terrible. I feel terrible. You have to make sure they're having their two brown bananas a couple of times a day or no detox. Okay. Now, these are what you should be asking your patients. Current medications or what they've taken in the last year. How often do they eat out? You know, McDonald's has double, double trouble aisles for getting your Big Mac, okay? <laughs> I, <laughs> I was out of town driving to something and I was forced to eat at a McDonald's. It's like all that there was and it was a nightmare. I threw 90% of it out. I couldn't even eat it. It was so awful. I thought, oh, I think McDonald's was better when I was a kid. I don't know what's going on now. It's just absolutely horrible. Ask about their job. You know, what did they do in the past? I love when they say they're retired. Well, okay, that's nice, but what did you used to do? What was your job? I've heard crop dusting. Farmers with Roundup. I've just heard all this stuff. We want to know about bug sprays. I have a patient who told me literally a week ago, I said, are you using bug sprays? Yes. I said, oh, you have a service? No, I'm, I'm using them. I said, oh, you're, you're spraying something around your house? No, I'm spraying it on my skin. Oh, are, are we all horrified yet? It's just one of these, it's called Cutter's Skin Sations. I, I, I had to look it up because I don't ever go down that aisle. But I thought, oh, and this person has migraines. Are we shocked? Unbelievable. Do they have a history of mono? Now, a lot of your patients don't know what Epstein-Barr virus is. So they, you have to tell them mono and some of them don't know what that is. So you have to explain mononucleosis, et cetera, et cetera. What is their level of stress? Everybody seems to be off the chart, but you will have patients that don't seem to have a lot of stress. They're, they're kind of okay. And of course, we want to know about a history of head trauma. Now, why do we want to know that? Because if people say, well, yes, I've had multiple concussions. Uh, I've had things that I weren't sure that they told me it wasn't a concussion, but I had some problems after that. That when you have a TBI, traumatic brain injury, the lining of the gut is affected in five minutes, not five months or five years. And do you know that they have found that the tremors in Parkinson's usually start 20 years after a head trauma? 
Isn't that interesting? So if you ask the patient, did you have a head trauma or an accident or something happened 20 years ago? Most of the time they're going to say yes, but it takes that long for it to show up. Everybody thinks it's just immediate. It isn't immediate. We know symptoms have, have been building for a long time before the body starts telling us something is wrong. Now, we know if you have a subluxation, this is going to cause inflammation. Why? Because if the bone is out of alignment, then it's going to have nerve interference and then things don't work right. Right? So I, my husband knows my personal neck set up and I tend to have like entire segment left body right. And so he knows how to adjust that. And if that's out, my energy is over. It's over. It's like somebody pulled the plug. And as soon as that's adjusted, bam, back to normal. And I know you've seen this in your patients. So if the patient says, I've been everywhere, no one has helped me because no one is talking about what's driving their inflammation. So you can adjust them or you can give them an acupuncture treatment. But if you don't address what they're doing in their lifestyle, they're just not ever going to get over it. And then they're going to think that you didn't help them. Okay. And my husband told me this a long time ago. If you listen to the patient long enough, they will give you the diagnosis. And this is why listening is a lost art. Now, I have to talk for a living. You guys have to probably talk for a living, I assume. But listening, you're going to pick up clues that the patient says, well, my son had to move back home and he has three kids and he can't find a job. Okay, is that stress? Yes. Well, we moved to a different house and we found out it has mold in it. I, you just start listening and making these mental clues and these notes that, okay, okay, this just can be part of the problem. I don't think we listen enough, do we? Now there's selective listening. That's during a marriage seminar. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> and I love this picture because there's no way in the world that we can avoid all of these things. How can we? Now, some of them we can. We can say uh, they're not going to smoke, or we're not going to drink, or we're going to cut back or eliminate sugar and white flour. Then we're going to cut back on coffee. Okay. And then prescription drugs, people can get healthy enough that they don't require the drugs. People ask me all the time, can you help me get off my medications? My answer is no. You have to deal with your prescribing physician on that. But prescription drugs are sometimes totally necessary and sometimes not. But the infections that keep going on. But negative attitudes. I, I love that that's on this. Because... Do you like to be around people that are negative? You know, misery loves company. I don't want to be around people like that. It depresses me. It brings me down. It's stressful because nothing is ever right. They live under a cloud. Uh, well, just go live with other people who live like that because I, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to be around it. I don't want to live with Pollyanna either where everything's, you know, hunky-dory all the time. You have to be realistic. But I believe the best attitude to have is a positive attitude, but yet a realistic attitude saying, OK, I don't think this makes sense realistically, whatever the situation or a problem is. Let's work on it. Let's work this out. But also to be positive that an income will be found. I mean, an income and outcome will be found that everybody agrees on. But be positive. This is how I approach parenthood. I had a student nurse ask me when I was in the hospital, what is your what are your thoughts about being a new mom? And I said, I'm going to be positive but realistic. The child will throw up at three in the morning and I'll have to get up and change the sheets. I already know this. So I was, that was the realistic part, but the positive part was always smiling when I went into her room and greeting her with a good morning. And when I went into her room, it was positive. Okay. So it just changes things. It changes your outlook. And then of course, if you lost your job or you have money issues, this is ongoing. This is everybody that I talk to that says, you know, I have a boat and an RV and a timeshare. It's like, well, get rid of that junk, right? Sell it today. All right. So we know that stress is driving inflammation. And look at what this says. If you have a fight, your inflammation can be elevated for up to three days. Now, if the adrenals are worn out from years and years and years and years of stress, they're not going to make as much cortisol anymore. Now, sometimes this can be a pituitary issue 
when you see really, really low cortisol, it's the adrenals are saying it's not our fault. We're not getting the messages aren't coming through. The memos are not coming through, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to make cortisol. And that's the pituitary issue. So if the pituitary is not releasing enough ACTH, adrenal corticotrophic hormone, then the, the adrenals aren't going to make any cortisol. So you're, you, a lot of the times the pattern is high blood pressure is high cortisol and low blood pressure is low cortisol. Okay. So we don't want to just take adrenal support from now on. I don't think it's a bad idea to take it during times of intense stress. And if you want to take a small amount every day, I don't think that's a bad idea. But some of your patients are taking 10 different adrenal products. Oh, too much. Okay. So patients with slow metabolism, they're, they're saying, I've done every diet that's out there, but they have a lot of stress. The stress is stopping the thyroid from working. So these are the women that eat an apple and drink a Diet Coke and go to the gym and their weight isn't budging. And I said, well, if you're under stress, your brain doesn't know if you're in a famine or a war zone. And it says, you know what? We need her to be around for a while. Let's hang on to all of her weight because she may have to live off of that excess for a period of time. The body is not as dumb as we think it is. Oh, I must, if I take this, I'll tell the body you need to do that. And I need to take this because my body isn't doing that. Well, the body is pretty darn smart and we don't give it enough credit because if things happen, it's for a reason. It's always for a reason. And our job with functional medicine is to find the reason behind it. For example, if a woman is anemic, but she has an infection, that's why she's anemic because iron is going to feed infection. So the body lowers the iron to help the body fight infection. Infection is the number one threat. So there's always a reason for something. Okay? And, and at the end of tonight, when we're getting towards the end, Dr. Sedano is going to talk about the, his favorite tests for inflammation. And that's going to be a, a really wonderful piece to listen to, <clears throat> excuse me, to know what you can test and find out about your patients. Now, what about methylation? Okay. And how does this affect inflammation? Well, you know why this does this? If you don't methylate, you don't detox. And if you don't detox, you've got inflammation. I had somebody tell me just this week that they have a bowel movement twice a week. Oh, don't you hear this from patients and you just have to make a face? It's like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. And so I say, okay, you're eating three times a day, 21 meals a week. You're going poop twice a week. This is 19 meals that are sitting in your colon. And they're not just sitting there playing tiddlywinks. They're, they're, there's a lot of toxic byproducts out of that. And, the, and you're, you have it at 98 degrees temperature. So I say, get a big plastic trash bag and put 19 meals in it. And now sit it outdoors at 98 degrees for a week. What's it going to smell like? Oh, it's horrid. Then they go, oh my gosh, that's right. That's what's happening inside of me. So we, that's why the people that have healthy potty are going to be less inflamed. <clears throat> but to carry around all that mess, uh-uh, no. And how many of your patients are on antacids? Now, I used to think it was 30 million Americans. <clears throat> Let me use my throat spray here. I used to think it was 30 million Americans. That's what I'd heard. Oh, no, no. Now it's 50% of Americans are taking antacids every day. Tums with calcium is an oxymoron. You can't absorb calcium if you take Tums. And it's calcium carbonate, which is limestone, crushed up rock. No, 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 no. I hope you're explaining this to your patients every day. I've said this before, bears repeating, get the laminated poster from sci public, scientific publishing, scientific publishing, and it's called, it says the digestive system. They have two or three to choose from. I just get the basic one. You need to explain this to your patients. This is you. Here's you taking this. Here's what's happening. Here's why your gallbladder isn't working. Here's your bowels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They like visual aids. They like that. Okay, so explain digestion to them. It doesn't have to be. 
a four hour in depth getting into the the chyme and the, all the different enzymes. No, no, they, they don't need that. But they need to know how their body's functioning and why you must fix their digestion. You must. And how many have had their gallbladder out? Too many. Too many. Sometimes even when it's totally healthy. Well, it was fine, but we took it out anyway. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to wake up and anything's been taken out that I don't know is going to be taken out. Okay. Starting with digestion, absorption, and assimilation is the key to everything. Everything. And you know when you have digested your food well, because you're going to see the evidence of that in the bathroom. Everything's fine. You're not bloated. You're not gassy. You're not burping. You're not having any of those things happen. And you're using the potty like a, like a regular person. That's that you know things are working. Now, how else? Can you tell the patient to know if it's working? Have them eat some beets and immediately their face will crunch up and they'll be like, eh, beets. And you'll say, well, not canned beets. Those are gross. Canned beets are disgusting. Real organic beets, real beets. And get some that have the beautiful beet greens attached because you can put those in your smoothie for extra detox power. Yum, yum. Okay. And they can steam the beets or they can roast them. They can cut them up with a little olive oil, a little dried rosemary, some goat's cheese. Bam. Uh, it's it's incredible. I love beets. I've loved beets since I was a baby. Love, love, love beets. And beets are going to thin the bile in the gallbladder, and they're going to make potty come out better, everything else. But here's how the patient can tell what their transit time is. So if they eat some beets, remember, they have to be real beets, not the canned junk. Real beets, let's say at 6 p.m. And now they're going to see how long it is till they see in the bathroom evidence of the beets. So they're going to have pink pee, and, and they're, that's normal for that. But the main thing is, are they going to see it in their stool? Okay, and then they see what time it is. Oh, it's 8 a.m. Okay, so that was 14 hours. That's a good time. So anywhere from 12 to 24 hours should see evidence of beets in the stool. If it's longer than that, your patient needs a lot of digestive support, okay? That's an easy test they can do. Now, if the patients are not sleeping, they if you've ever been through this, if you've had a new baby in the house, if you've, uh, you're in a different time zone, things are going to affect your sleep. And when you haven't had enough sleep, how do you feel? How do you feel? Oh, horrible. So if the cortisol is raised and they're drinking, you know, exuberant amounts of coffee, this is going to raise the insulin because it raises the cortisol, more weight gain, insulin resistance, and now they stay up until two or three in the morning. I have patients that tell me they don't go to bed till midnight. Two hours before midnight of sleep is equal to that, like one hour, of, well, I'm sorry, one hour of sleep before midnight. That's what I meant to say. One hour of sleep before midnight is equal to two times, like two more times of that afterwards, okay? So even if you sleep from 9 to 12, that's as good as from 12 to 6 because people do not, they don't want to go to bed early. I love to go to bed early. It's a treat to go to bed early. It's like, oh, this is so wonderful because it's it just is good for your body. Even if you're not actually sleeping, you're resting just resting and releasing your muscles, you know, just tighten and release your muscles and deep breathing. You need to do this and please don't let them use, <clears throat> excuse me, their foam as an alarm clock. All right, so they can take melatonin, 5-HTP is 5-hydroxytryptophan and it converts into serotonin or they can take GABA or they can take CBD or hemp or whatever they need to take, but they and magnesium, of course, we know that. <clears throat> it's going to help them to sleep. But 5-HTP, if it doesn't work, it means they're not converting it. Then we have a protein issue. Now, <clears throat> here's what's linked to chronic insomnia and infections. If you don't sleep, that's when you're repairing. So in your sleep, I tell people the, the little crew comes out with the work hats on, 
their tools and they're going to fix all the junk that you were exposed to during the day and clean stuff up and they bring in the little work trucks and that's what they're doing. People like it when you tell them stuff like that. They're like, oh, that's, that's so cute because they have no idea what's going on in their body all the time. And of course, chronic fatigue, adrenals are a mess. <clears throat> they're having chronic pain issues because they're not sleeping. And the pain is also what's keeping them from sleeping. And then the fibromyalgia, kidney disease, but these people that take Benadryl to sleep, that frightens me. That's a methylation issue right there is because of the high histamine levels. Now, let me bring this up for a moment. Let's say the patient has high histamine response. So what do we need that is going to counteract that? Our good eosinophil action, which is one of your white blood cells. <clears throat> but if you're stressed out and your cortisol goes up, your immune response goes down, remember that. So you're not gonna make the eosinophils that contain histaminase that breaks down histamine. Then you can't sleep. So pain wakes people up. But this is what they're eating, cereal and ice cream, probably together. Who knows? That's America's favorite bedtime snack. So that's why they go right off to sleep. All that carbohydrate, boop. And they're just saying, oh, my, my tummy is full. I always tell, love to tell patients that if their pants are dry, <laughs> their tummy's full, and they've been rocked a little bit, they, they should go right off to sleep. But now they're waking up between two and five, aren't they? And they'll say, I wake up in the middle of the night. <clears throat> excuse me and you'll say is it between two and five and they'll say how did you know that because that's the liver hour that's when the liver's going through a backwash so that's what wakes them up and this is when hot flashes happen it's when they happen it's like oh got to get up 2 a.m and it either is because the blood sugar is dropping and or the gallbladder is having a problem and here comes the hot flash okay don't get on your phone in the middle of the night nobody's doing anything on social media that you need to know about, okay? Deep breathing is excellent and, and vastly underused, I think. But is, do they have an old mattress? You know, it's kind of sinking down in the center. Get rid of it. Get a nice firm mattress. That also helps sleep immensely. <clears throat> now, everybody loves to talk about food and they always want to know what's the best diet. Now, I do not do one size fits all for diets. If I have a patient, for example, I have a patient right now and her liver enzymes went from 200 to 700 in two months. It's autoimmune hepatitis. Well, what am I gonna tell her to eat? Am I gonna tell her to eat a lot of protein? Not right at the moment. So I am telling her to eat a vegetarian diet just for a few weeks. We're trying to take the stress off the liver. Keto is very tough on the liver, okay? You, all that protein, breaking down into ammonia and urea, it's, it's tough on the liver. So if a patient has a liver issue, sometimes just resting and not necessarily intermittent fasting, in case if they're hypoglycemic, you don't wanna do that. But if they're having an issue with the liver, sometimes I'll say, let's take a little break and just eat a lot of soup and salad and maybe some omelets or something, but not heavy, heavy food. <clears throat> Now, this is why we do food testing. Now, some people will say, I'm on an elimination diet. You know how long that takes? That's so boring. Who wants to look at their food every time and go, all right, I ate that. I wonder if I should eliminate that. Now, <clears throat> they will say <clears throat> that they think if they don't react to it immediately, it's not a problem. No, it can still be a problem. So the IgE response is like when you go to an allergist and they you know, they prick the back of your hand or your back or something. <clears throat> they're looking for food sensitivities. And that's an immediate or anaphylactic response. That's what they're looking for. And then they'll say it's this grass or this tree or this berry or whatever it is. <clears throat> but an IgG response can be up to 72 hours. So you can eat something on a Tuesday and not have a reaction until Friday and say, it can't be what I ate Tuesday because it's been three days. But I have had people react to healthy foods. Had a brain patient, her husband giving her copious amounts of turmeric, turns out she was reacting to turmeric. So there you go. But elimination diets are a waste of time. Just do the test and find out all at once, and then do it. Assume nothing, 
We know what assume means. So <clears throat> top 10 repeat offenders. Eating too much. <laughs> this is perfect timing for the holidays, isn't it? Eating too much or and or poor digestion. Now, not only eating too much, but eating too quickly. Why do people eat quickly? Do they not know that they have to eat every day and set aside enough time for that? And they know they got to eat, but they're they're busy. And I hate to see people eat in the car. I cannot stand it. They're wolfing down a hamburger that basically two bites, kind of like John Belushi in Animal House, just stuffing the entire sandwich into his mouth. <clears throat> That's what they're doing. And then they're driving on the freeway. And there's traffic and noise and stress. And now their food feels like a bowling ball in their stomach. And they just cannot stand it. It's like, oh, and here comes the Tums. Here comes the Rolades. Here comes something. Okay. So they're eating too quickly. They're eating too much. And they don't realize that they need some enzymes. Now, just putting your patient <clears throat> excuse me, on enzymes is a big deal. And of course, white flour products, there's a there's an old saying, the whiter your bread, the quicker you're dead. So, you know, tell your patients fun things like that. So this is what I tell them. If they had a hypoglycemic episode in my office and I had a glass of orange juice, a piece of candy, or a piece of bread, which is going to raise the sugar the fastest? And the answer is bread. They will never believe that. Fried foods. <clears throat> neurotoxin chemical called acrylamide and I had a patient who had high levels of acrylamide and ended up in a wheelchair because of it because she couldn't detoxify I'm and that's now that's severe inflammation could not move anything from the chest down from acrylamide and of course animal products this can be a sensitivity to arachidonic acid which is found in poultry red meat and eggs and this is why people and i'm not saying that everybody should be a vegetarian i don't believe that <clears throat> i think eating right for your blood type is, is pretty darn accurate a lot of the time but i like people to do the mediterranean diet or whatever whatever works for them as long as their labs are right they feel good i'm okay with that but if someone is sensitive to these foods and they become a vegetarian or start eating more plant-based diet for a while this is why a lot of people lose weight on a plant-based diet. I don't think it's something you can maintain forever and ever and ever and ever unless you're really good at it, which some people are. But for a period of time, they're like, oh my gosh, I, I dropped 25 pounds without even trying. It's because of their food. The nitrates that are found in deli meats. If you're going to eat bacon, <clears throat> get the natural bacon with no nitrates in it. And, and it's out there, okay, if you're going to eat that. Alcohol, which is depleting B6, which chews up ammonia. So I've been through this before, but this also bears repeating. The normal metabolism of protein is it becomes ammonia and urea in the liver and is sent to the kidneys, and that's why we measure blood urea nitrogen. It's the ammonia-urea pathway. So if there's too much ammonia because the person isn't breaking down their proteins, like taking antacids, they create too much ammonia, which perpetuates leaky gut. <clears throat> but the ammonia also affects the conversion of your neurotransmitters from tyrosine to dopamine, tryptophan to serotonin, and then melatonin. These are all affected by something called BH4, and ammonia gets rid of BH4, so now we have more depression, which is probably why people drink anyway, okay? And so if alcohol is depleting B6, this is affecting mood, but this is also affecting sulfonation pathways. So now the conversion of homocysteine to glutathione is B6 dependent. So alcohol actually interferes with you making antioxidants. Probably most alcoholics don't even care about that. I don't know. I don't know. I've never been around an alcoholic. I never grew up with an alcoholic. But I don't know what they care about or they don't care about. But I just know what happens to them physically when they continue to drink. Now, some people do it and they're fine. They seem to be fine. No problem. Now, a lot of your patients, I hope you're asking about sugar intake, but also diet drinks. 
okay? Even diet drinks raise insulation, and that was quoted by Dr. Jason Fong, who wrote the book, The Obesity Code, and said the problem with diet drinks is not that they raise blood sugar, it's they raise insulin. And this is why nobody ever lost 50 pounds drinking diet drinks. It can't happen. It cannot happen, and they know that, and it perpetuates the sales of it. If I keep drinking it, someday I'll lose weight, and they continue to gain weight, okay? So additives, food colorings, and preservatives, oh, tons of antioxidants. Okay. I have trouble seeing the consequences of poor food choices. Print this one out and put it at your front desk. <clears throat> then people are going to say, oh, really? But who are they asking for food advice? Are they asking us? No, not a lot of the time. They're asking their doctor, and their doctor says, I have no idea what you should do. Here, here's, here's the best answer. Low fat and exercise. Well, there's a guaranteed problem, right? You want to do that. I love this one. I love this one. <laughs> Billy has 32 candy bars. <laughs> These are great. These are great. You need to, if you do anything in your waiting room, and you can put up PowerPoints or you can put up things that just loop that people can just read, put stuff like this in there because they'll go, gosh, you know, my doctor said it didn't have anything to do with what I was eating. Oh, we don't want to manage disease. We don't want to get into disease management. That's not our calling. Ours is disease disappearance, right? But people are not told when they're pre-diabetic and how dangerous this is. It's the only disease that's toxic to every single part of the body. And people come in, I'm having vision issues. I'm having, it could be vitamin A, right? <clears throat> but it also, all the diabetics that you see are low in magnesium, zinc, and B12. All of them. Magnesium, zinc, and B12. And if they take metformin, it depletes B12 for three years after they quit taking it. There's no reason for anybody to be diabetic, but your diabetic patients are constantly inflamed and they won't quit eating what they want, okay? And now they're on an insulin pump. No, no, no. So this is what I tell patients. You are at a crossroads. You have a choice. If you go down this route, you're gonna have more and more medications, then pretty soon you're on insulin, then you're on insulin more than once a day, and then you it's gonna, and I'm not saying it does, but it could possibly lead to amputations, and it's gonna to lead to losing your vision and your kidneys are gonna shut down. It, we, we know the drill, right? But here's the other pathway, okay? And this leads to not needing insulin anymore, unless they're type one, but not needing insulin anymore, off medications, and have a happy life. And when people tell me that they have to die, of, well, I have to die of something. I don't even want to talk to them after that. Do you? Well, I have to die of something. Well, at least control what you can control and leave the stuff you can't control alone. But don't perpetuate the problem. So these are the problems with diabetic patients. They are the least compliant. So they've had the whole playground since they were a kid. Now they can't go on the slide, the monkey bars. They'll take insulin and jump the fence. They don't care. They don't care. They don't care. Now, I'm not saying 100% of them. I'm saying 90% of them are this way. So now they don't have enough dopamine, which can be lack of hormones, right? Tyrosine stuff is affecting this. But B vitamins. And also with dopamine, if you don't have enough testosterone, you can't make dopamine. Enough progesterone, you can't make dopamine. Okay. <clears throat> So this is why if a person is stressed, their hormone production goes down, the cortisol goes up, hormones go down, now they don't make dopamine. And now they want to gamble and eat junk and it's like they, they just, they need that adrenaline rush. They need that. So don't give your diabetic patients too much to do and don't tell them not to eat any more donuts or they'll leave your office and go to Krispy Kreme. I'm telling you, that's what they do. What does caveat mTOR mean? Anybody know? Buyer beware. Very good. 
But getting your patient's blood sugar normalized is going to help the following. It's going to help adrenal function. It's going to help mood. It's going to help their heart. It's going to help save their muscles. It's going to, it's going to help everything. But this is why I swear 90% of the time when I do presentations, it all comes back to this. It always comes back to this, okay? Because remember, if your blood sugar drops when you're sleeping, which is normal because you're not eating during the night, your brain says to your adrenals, I, I got to have some glucose here. What's up? And so the adrenals like, okay, okay, okay. And they you give it a little bump of cortisol and then the brain's okay and it's okay. And then it drops again and the brain says, I need some more. And the adrenals might say, you know what? I'm totally out of that. I have some adrenaline. That's all I got. Boom. And the person wakes up and now they're counting the tiles on the ceiling and they cannot go back to sleep. If the patient cannot fall asleep, it's from high cortisol. If they can't stay asleep, it's blood sugar. Okay. They don't want to eat something before bed. They think they're all, you know, isn't this great that we're not doing that? but they're going too long without eating. So if they eat a protein-based snack, they're going to sleep better. I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen it work so many times. Just enough protein to tell the body we're okay, we're okay. Because with some people when they fast, it's too long because they wanna be at the head of the pack. Look at me, I did 24 days kind of thing, no. Your brain is going to get scared and say, okay, where's the food? Where's the food? And now it's going to, that's a stress response. And here comes the cortisol and the weight doesn't budge. This is why it doesn't work for some people. So Dr. Sedano is going to talk about this comprehensive diabetes panel and the diabetes panel. Okay. So here's some pathways for you. I love pathways. I love them. So now we have anemia for whatever reason, aspirin use, or it's a cycling female. Now we have brain fog because there's not enough oxygen, which is stressful because they're not eating enough or not often enough like hypoglycemia. Now the blood sugar is up and down. The adrenals are activated to straighten this out. So is the liver, right, with the glucagon. Progesterone goes down because the cortisol went up. The periods get worse, more blood loss, more anemia, and the whole thing starts over. This is how I want you to think. This is thinking and linking, which is functional medicine. This is how this works. So if you say, how does this happen to start with? You go back upstream as far as you can. You write it down and just draw it out. Okay, if this happens, what does that cause? Well, here's the few things it can cause. Okay, and what happens after that? And then what happens after that? That's how you have to figure things out. This It's just like doing just uh, the, this kind of information is, is what's done when people are figuring out how to build something. Well, first we add this and oh, we got to put that in there somewhere. We got to punch that in and, and we have to put this together. So if there's not enough stomach acid or enzymes, that's what you need to kill parasites. Okay. They're not just going away on their own. They like it in there. They've, they've set up housekeeping. Now we have no protein or fat assimilation because we didn't have enough acid or enzymes. Now we didn't make any cholesterol there wasn't enough fat. Now we don't have any hormones. Now we don't have any neurotransmitters. Remember, you need progesterone and testo or testosterone to make dopamine. No neurotransmitters, okay? And also, progesterone controls GABA, which helps you to chill out. Then we have depression, infertility, and low thyroid hormone production. Now we have weight gain, and cold hands and feet, and hair loss. It all started back with the stomach. See, because <clears throat> the thyroid is going to cause the weight gain, the cold hands and feet, and the hair loss. This is why this has to work. It has this has to all go together. But you don't just start out by <clears throat> throwing them on thyroid stuff. You have to go back to the stomach and say, "Let's start here." That is 99% of the time. But do you see how this can work? And the woman's like, "My hair's falling out in clumps," and one woman said it looked like carpet in her shower. Well, that's most likely is going to be the thyroid. But if the woman is infertile, it's the thyroid 90% of the time because that's telling the ovaries what to do. But if the woman is stressed, the body will not make hormones. Now, let me just 
diverge on that for a moment. If the woman is stressed, the hormones won't be made. Why? Because the brain doesn't want her to conceive it's another stress. If you don't think child carrying and child bearing is stressful, why do you think people only have two or three of them in their entire life? That's all they can do. <laughs> I have a friend that she and her husband have 14 kids. Oh my gosh, they could have repopulated like California in the front frontier days by themselves. Not me. No, I wasn't meant to do that. Two was my limit. Two is my limit. And physically, it was just enough for me to do. And so if a person is saying, I can't have a child, there's other issues besides them having to go on fertility medication, which causes horrible side effects, horrible side effects. Just follow the path. Start with one thing. Okay, are they going to the bathroom? Yes or no? There's your first question. Though if they're not, it's a stomach problem. Is it because of parasites eating their food? Is it they have malabsorption issues? Can be parasites. You can see high monocytes, eosinophils on blood work. Now the, the parasites are eating all the protein, but without enough acid, you're not going to make the bile. Okay, the bile isn't going to be released in the gallbladder to absorb your fats. And without cholesterol, can't make hormones. Hormones made out of fat. See how that works? Okay. I love that. I love drawing out stuff like that. It's fun. So here's a recipe for inflammation. I thought this would be fun. Really crappy food for a day. See how you feel the next day. This is during Christmas season. Now multiply that times every day for weeks, months, and years. This will be good up front in your office too. Now add in an acid use, PPIs, and missing gallbladders. Stress, lack of sleep, and family and financial problems that keep you awake. Like how am I going to pay the rent tomorrow? Or how am I going to pay my car payment that I couldn't live without? Now I hate it because I pay too much money for it. Sell it and, and get a cheaper car, right? Mix in some couch time in front of the TV and no exercise. They have said that for every minute of, let's see, every hour of television, it's a minute off your life. Every hour. Fold in some medications over time. It's a recipe. Fold in the medications and then top it off with a nice dose of I hate my job. You know what? Life is short, people. If you hate your job, get a different one. But don't make everybody else miserable. If you hate your job, just go drive a bus or work somewhere else. But but don't stay in the job that you're in because you hate it, because then everybody else will hate you in it. Don't do it. Love your job. Remember, this is a calling. This is not something you just apply for and, and show up and punch a time clock. This has no time clock. This is something you're meant to do. You know how you know when you're meant to do something? How do you know that? People ask me all the time, how do I know I'm in the right job? Do you get up looking forward to who you're going to help that day? Do you get excited about a challenging case to try to figure it out? Do you want to learn? Do you read books about your profession? Then you know you're in the right job. But if you just hate it, just don't, just don't do it anymore. Do something else. Because this is causing inflammation to your body. And it's not worth it. And this is why we have seen this over and over in our practice. Patients who work the same job for 40 years, okay, like a factory job or something. And they hate the job. They hate it, but they have to do it. And six months after retirement, dead. They're dead. They worked all that time. No, no, I don't want to do that. I want to laugh and have fun and love on people and think, oh, I'm going to figure this one out. I'm going to figure this one out. That's what keeps you going. Otherwise, you're not meant to do this, but you know you are. You know you are. But this is what your patients are doing. Put this out there and say, this is why you're inflamed. Just read this or just make it a handout. <laughs> Stick it in their bag when they leave. There you go. Trans fats can be in a product that says no trans fat. Well, if no means no, to me it means zero, but legally it can have up to half a gram in it. They're in your body for 103 days, rolling around, all them donuts, rolling around. They promote insulin resistance. Why do they do that? They harden and stiffen the cell membrane. We need a permeable cell membrane to get glucose in and get trash out. Just think if you have an unhealthy cell, and it never gets rid of its trash. That's why it's unhealthy, 
right? So as goes the cell, so goes the organ and the organism, which is us. But it starts at the cell. So when people, if they eat it once in a great while, I'm talking about like once or twice a year, they splurge, they have some, and they're usually okay with that. You know, I mean, it is life after all. You'll be at a birthday party. You're going to have something. You'll be at, at Christmas with granny who made red velvet cake. I mean, I live in the South. Everybody seems to eat that stuff with all that food coloring in it. Red velvet cake. But granny isn't going to be around very long. So just make granny happy and eat a piece of cake. It's not going to kill you, okay? Because if you eat poorly on a daily basis, that's what kills you. If you eat poorly once in a while at a celebration, it's called life and you should enjoy it. Don't be such a purist that everybody hates you. I can't be around that and I can't touch that. It's like, no, I'm not going to invite them to a party. You know, that's not any fun. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is about omega-6s because everybody focuses on omega-3s, which are excellent. But let's look at omega-6s here because this is how you determine if uh, what it could be causing your patient's inflammation. So here's the linoleic acid and it's coming from these following oils. It can be just found in the diet. And then you have an enzyme. Delta 60 saturase or D60. And this requires zinc to function and B6 and magnesium. B6 and magnesium and zinc. Remember what I said diabetics were low in? Magnesium, zinc, and what? B12. That's right. Now it converts into gamma linolenic acid, GLA. And here's the sources of it, which is excellent, by the way, for breast inflammation. I'll just throw that in there. Excellent for that. Also excellent for eczema. So now it converts into DGLA, dihomo gamma linolenic acid. That is actually requiring the elongase enzyme, which they didn't put here in this. So from GLA to DGLA is el the elongase enzyme. And now it turns either into prostaglandin 1, the odd numbers are the good ones, anti-inflammatory or it can turn downstream into prostaglandin 2, pro-inflammatory. And this is where the COX starts to show up. So people take COX inhibitors, don't they? Or COX 1 or 2 inhibitors, usually COX 2 inhibitors, because this is a prostaglandin 2, which is pro-inflammatory. Now, let's keep going a moment. So the DGLA is going to convert via the delta-5 desaturase now, into arachidonic acid. Remember I said it's in chicken and, and beef. So it can become in certain people, and it can become pro-inflammatory. Now, this was my issue with a patient. Two-year-old boy, massive eczema, massive eczema. Did this test. He had <clears throat> low delta-60 saturase near the top, okay? but he had elevated delta-5 desaturase. So it was over converting into arachidonic acid. So if I had put him on evening primrose or black currant, it would have, oh, it would have actually promoted inflammation. Okay, you tracking this? So it would have promoted inflammation because of the delta-5 overactivity. It was going too much into arachidonic acid. I think I'm the only person on the planet who would Google, ready? How do you lower overactive delta-5 desaturase? Who, who's going to ask that? Now, everybody's like, pull up an image of, you know, Mark Wahlberg in a, in a, in a bikini. Okay. <laughs> like a speed. <laughs> That's all anybody wants to see. Okay. Well, what is it, what was the answer to this? You might be asking me. What was the answer? The answer is sesame seed oil. Isn't that cool? So if someone has high levels of arachidonic acid because of overactive delta-5 desaturase, you can calm this down with sesame seed oil. But wait, wait, you have to think a minute. Why should I be careful with sesame seed oil? When would I want to be careful with that? When you have somebody who has high platelets because sesame seed oil raises platelets. So if someone has high platelets like 400 and above, like even 350 and above, they're going to have a higher risk of clot formation. This is why sesame seed oil helps people with low platelets, like leukemia, where you want to raise platelets. And they're bleeding out too much. They can't, they can't clot. That's what sesame seed oil does. It shines in that area. But it can also promote clot formation if you're not careful. 
You see why when you learn this stuff, you're like, I got it. Because you don't want to just rush in and throw stuff at people without thinking this through. Well, what does this person's blood work show? Does it show high playlists? Well, then I'm not going to do sesame seed oil. I'm not going to do that. Okay. But also if they're sensitive to arachidonic acid, it can cause skin rashes, joint pain, all kinds of stuff. And when you start getting them off of those foods for a while and they feel better, it's because it's all converting into this. Okay. This is why you have to have more information than just one test. So for example, on 95% of my patients, I'm going to do blood work. And I'm going to do hormone tests. Why? The hormone test is going to tell me what's going on with detox pathways and adrenals and everything else. But the blood test is going to tell me, do they have a nutrient deficiency that's causing these issues in the hormones? You have to tie it together. Okay. Now, here's, we're back to NF-kappa B. Okay, this can persist as chronic inflammation, even if your patients are eating perfect diets, but they have an increase in arachidonic acid and prostaglandin 2, COX-2, they're going to be inflamed. So here's what the patient, and we've all seen this patient, maybe multiple times. I'm doing everything right. I'm eating well. I exercise. I eat really clean. I'm, I'm uh, you know, doing meditation or prayer, whatever they want to do, manage their stress. They can't lose weight. Okay, so the essential fatty acids are a huge deal. And remember that trans fats are poor fats. So they're going to drive the inflammatory process because they're bad fats. Here's the benefits of omega-3s. Okay, helps with moods, helps with your eye health. Excellent for pregnancy. Why, why would it be good during pregnancy? Because breast milk is 95% fat. Get the fat going. So that's what helps the brain to be made in the baby. It's a nice, healthy brain. It's a good, fatty brain. Supports the heart. Oh, oh, no, can't take any fats for your heart. Oh, yeah, your heart needs fat to work. Prevents cancer. Impo improves the joint health. It's lubrication, okay? This is, I always tell people about the Tin Man and the Wizard of Ozzy. What did he want? He was squeaking and creaking. What did he want? He wanted his oil can. Okay, so they oiled up his joints and then he was dancing and tooting all over the place. There you go. That's why fats lubricate joints. It improves your sleep and fights inflammation. Now, if you're not sure about the omega-6s with the patient or they don't want to do the test, you can always do omega-3s. There you go. But a lot of people aren't taking enough, enough, enough omega-3s. They're taking, a, you know, like a thousand milligrams a day. No, sometimes it needs to be four to 5,000, which is four to five grams to really get the needle moving. But not all at once, obviously, it would be running to the bathroom. <clears throat> so doctor's data offers a fatty acids erythrocytes test. Sometimes they can be taking just too much fish oil. So I have a patient, if they have any of these issues, I want to check fatty acid levels, joint issues, eczema, psoriasis, brain fog, dementia, and couples struggling with infertility. I will tell you that if vitamin D is low in a blood test, wouldn't you assume, in this case you are allowed to assume, wouldn't you assume that vitamin A is also low? Well, it's a fat-soluble hormone, is it? I mean, it's just a fat-soluble vitamin, sorry. Then, then it's necessary. If vitamin D is low, we assume vitamin A is low. And cod liver oil, for example, is an excellent source of vitamin A and D. And vitamin A helps infertility. There you go. All right. <clears throat> this was the kid, okay, that had this eczema. I mean, this mother was a helicopter mom. Unbelievable. Everything in the house had to be tested, everything. The materials in the house had to be perfect. I mean, the whole shebang and had a wonderful birth experience. No epidural, no antibiotics, nothing. And he <clears throat> was scratching and scratching and scratching, everybody couldn't sleep, okay? So this was him. High levels of omega-3s, but low omega-6s. All he was eating was whole foods, good fat, and broth. This, and the mother was so proactive about this kid, and he's just the cutest little thing. But he was constipated, but he was on fat, that usually lubricates the bowel. What's going on? Blood sugar was normal, but his previous test 
<clears throat> from another functional medicine doctor showed C. diff and H. pylori, all right, clostridium. And I asked the mom, what did they do about this? And she said, well, he put him on something for C. diff. And I said, but what about H. pylori? Nothing. You cannot kill C. diff if you don't kill H. pylori. Cannot, 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 cannot. Cannot. Did I say that enough times? What about Roundup? Okay. And other weed killers. It's not just that one. But I've never had one of these patients that hasn't used this stuff for years. Toxins are everywhere, <clears throat> and especially in these professions. Mechanics, hairstylists, factory workers, welders, construction workers. They're exposed to everything, painters especially. And then people are spraying for bugs. They're showering chlorinated water. They're using all these chemicals. And the, the liver's going, help me, help me. So I run a hair analysis. Doctor's data has one, shows me the toxin levels and the minerals. Remember that metals displace minerals. If you have a patient, <clears throat> that is having muscular issues too, we know that minerals help the muscles, okay? Minerals help muscle strength and, and muscle pain and, and minerals are the key. We can't make any minerals, we have to take them. But metals are getting rid of the minerals. And then the person says, I just, I, I stay dehydrated and I, I just, my heart's all out of rhythm and all these other things can be from metals. <clears throat> so I don't wanna put people on certain detoxification because they're too toxic. You have to really, really slow. So if your patient says, I'm on a the South Beach diet or I'm on this diet or I'm on this diet, you have to do detox along with it because as they lose weight, the stuff's gonna come out of the tissue. And if they don't have the detox support, it's gonna cause problems, okay? So I think it's better to keep your room clean instead of wait till once a year till you can't open the door anymore to clean out your room. Doesn't that make sense? That sounds like a mom, doesn't it? <laughs> so if you take a little bit of liver support daily, that keeps the room clean. You don't have to wait, do a big detox once a year, just address it a little bit every day. It's like putting money in your savings account. You put some in there on a regular basis and then pretty soon you have a nice little nest egg sitting over there. Don't wait till once a year and, and, and say, I'm going to do it at the end of the year because you won't have any money to do it. It's funny how money patterns mimic body patterns. I think that's very interesting. Now, <clears throat> the NF kappa B is affecting liver detox by shutting down cytochrome P450 phase one. Multiple chemical sensitivities was long thought of as a sluggish liver. It turns out it's immune activation. What, now, let's talk about that a minute. What does that mean? Chemicals in the body are highly toxic. So we used to think, well, the liver just needs to be perked up and it will handle it. The immune system is saying, I am overloaded. I am the problem, fighting, trying to fight off infection, clean up the blood, and this is what's leading to more chemical sensitivities. Remember, it dumps everything to the lymph. The lymph is full. And now the chemical sensitivities are going to ramp up, okay? Cleaning the lymph is just one of the best things you can do for anybody. And by the way, liver detox is now called hepatic biotransformation. Doesn't that sound elite? Oh, we're on a journey through hepatic biotransformation world. That's what we're doing. So some patients do a liver cleanse. They don't feel better. They don't lose weight. One of my patients told me she gained 10 pounds on the liver cleanse. I said, what? What happened? Well, I asked my husband for a divorce. So I guess she was cleaning out more than her liver, wasn't she? Because you know what? You need to tell your patients this when you put them on a liver cleanse, okay? Anger is stored in the liver. Anger is in the liver. Resentment is in the gallbladder. If somebody starts cleaning up the liver, they might have a couple of days where they're pretty mad. Just tell them just to be on the lookout for that. And a lot of them will say, you know, that that's right. That happened to me. Because things get stored in the subconscious and it affects organ health. And so if somebody's angry, uh, that liver isn't going to work very well. Okay. So this is for people that, so this woman, obviously something came out of her liver and she wanted to leave. So never know what's going to happen. 
So here's also interleukin-1. Neuroinflammation, we don't want that. We don't want inflammation in the brain. Weight loss suppression, joint inflammation, muscle inflammation, GI inflammation. Now, what does this mean? Increase in lipopolysaccharide response. That's more gut issues. Suppression of hepatic biotransformation. I just love to say it like that. Breakdown of mucosal tight junctions leading to leaky gut. Processed foods, GMO foods, trans fats, allergic or sensitive foods, our environmental compounds. Do you see why you can't just see a patient once and fix everything? No way are you going to do that. You're not going to do it. 50 million people having autoimmune disease, and we know since the pandemic, it's going to be about twice that number. Kaboom. Okay. <clears throat> so we wonder why in this country we eat crap, don't go outside, hate our jobs, too many medications, drink and smoke too much, and then we get a diagnosis. Listen, there's always a payday. You cannot take money out of an account that has a zero balance. And most people have a zero health account balance. But now here's the check they're writing for $500 and they give it to the teller and the teller looks at their account and laughs and throws the check back at them. I can't give you $500. You don't have it here. That's what we do with our health. We don't invest in our health and we want to make withdrawals. And there's nothing there. Isn't that a great way to discuss that with your patients? Anybody could understand that. Patients need to understand basic ways to just, if you don't have a visual aid, lay it out for them in terms they can grasp. They'll say, you know, that's right. If I don't have any money, I, I can't pay my bills. I can't go on vacation. I, I can't do things I need to do. I can't invest, can't save for the future, buy a house, all these things they want to do. Same way with their health, same exact way, okay? So here we go. Let's say you have some low-grade inflammation. You notice you're gaining weight, you're not changing your diet. You start exercising more, nothing happens. Start having seasonal allergies. Brain fog and joint pain. Now you take anti-inflammatories, nothing changes. You have high blood pressure, never did before. You're told to avoid salt and manage stress. <clears throat> it's the sugar they should avoid, not the salt. You start having erectile dysfunction or loss of libido. Now you need an antidepressant. Now your emotions start to mess up. You become apathetic and your body hurts all the time. You start thinking about retirement, but that's not gonna be fun because everything stinks. You just wanna sleep, but how much you, no matter how much you sleep, you don't feel better. Chemicals are starting to bother you. This is your average patient. Where do you start? You gotta talk to them, find out what they're involved in, what, they, <clears throat> what they're exposed to, okay? Here's the signs and symptoms of this, of inflammation and autoimmunity. White blood cells are out of whack. And here's the test you can order, that Dr. Sedano is in, in the wings as we speak, ready to move to the forefront. What about inflammation in the brain? There's more Alzheimer's than breast cancer, people. Okay? This is frightening. Things can be done to help breast cancer. But like Dr. Bredesen said, everyone knows a cancer survivor. No one knows an Alzheimer's survivor. 4,000 papers have been published linking inflammation to this. <clears throat> and if somebody has a patient with Alzheimer's in their family, they're eating sugar and sugar and sugar because at least they can taste that. But the last thing their family should do is let them eat and drink junk. Here's this 71-year-old man. <clears throat> He's on about 400 drugs. Just kidding. Diabetic, high blood pressure, ran the Cyrex Array 12. This was back in the day. Almost all of these markers cause either gut permeability, inflammation, all these things. If it's inflammatory, it's in there. So this is what happens is when they have infections, it's going to show up, especially yeast. I see that all the time. <clears throat> So if you've got inflammation, you're going to have brain inflammation. Leaky gut means leaky brain, okay? You can get another liver or kidney. I don't want anybody else's brain. Do you know anybody else's brain you want? I'm scared, okay? And is it any wonder that dementia is going on? It's no wonder. It's now like 30 million Americans have the uh, APO44 for high risk for Alzheimer's. So we know that increased inflammation is supported by gut-brain axis. Subclinical inflammation due to leaky gut can force a constant immunological response 
and the person just stays inflamed all the time. That's actually a little video you can look up on YouTube. Um, it's called Nature Video, and it says gut barrier function is kind of fun to watch. The, the, the graphics in it are amazing. So listen to this. Curcumin, sulforaphane, what's that? Sulfur containing foods, right? Like cruciferous vegetables. Quercetin and berry extract, all significantly inhibited T cell proliferation. Curcumin has the potential to protect against cardiac inflammation. It's suppressing these inflammatory cytokines, okay? And curcumin, outstanding anti-inflammation and neuroprotective effects. So here's one of the products that Avexia has, curcumin essentials. <clears throat> the only time people have a problem with this is usually if they're taking too much at a time and it is a spice and it can cause a little bit of inflammation if they take too much. You don't, you don't have to take the whole bottle every day. I mean, come on, we don't wanna do that. We wanna take enough that it works, but it's amazing and it's been around for thousands of years. But anything that's gonna be natural is obviously much better for us, isn't it? Here's cruciferous. And this is what helps with toxic estrogens, just like BioDim is gonna help get rid of these toxic load, which drives more inflammation. There you go. Inflammatrol. I love this, look at this. Supporting healthy lymphatic drainage. Anything that does that, burdock is another, is an herb that really helps to clean the lymph. There's all kinds of goodies out there, okay? But movement is what's gonna help the lymph. And this is why the more people sit and sit and sit, the more inflamed they're gonna be. Now look where this says, it has a combination of herbs, nutrients, and proteolytic enzymes. When I have a patient who's inflamed, you know what I tell them? Take your enzymes on an empty stomach at least twice a day. Amazing, amazing, amazing. So now these things are happening in menopause. They're still going to be inflamed. Not, not good. Okay. Seven dwarves of menopause. Psycho is my favorite. Yeah, that's, that's always a fun one. And estrogen is affecting superoxide dismutase. When you have that, you break down superoxide, which is a radical, free radical, from turning into peroxynitrite, which is a nightmare. Estrogen deficiency promotes the production of T cells and cytokines. This is where hot flashes are coming from, okay? And hair loss, low mineral status, too much testosterone, too much test estrogen in men, poor circulation, and the adrenals, okay? All these things are in the notes for you about all these things that can be happening and what it's causing. Here's another pathway for you about cortisol and how this can lead to PCOS. Here's adrenal complete, tyrosine, which is an excellent thyroid supporter, vitamin C that the adrenals use a ton of that. And oh, I love this. See, it balances cortisol and replenish the catecholamines. Uh, yeah. We need norepinephrine and epinephrine. Those are copper dependent. Make sure the patient is eating anti-inflammatory foods. Check their med usage. Ask about stress. Rule out infections. Ask about toxins and correct those subligations. And, and also to use something like this. It has the alkalizing grass juices in it, which is going to help because 90% of your patients are too acidic. And the inulin is going to help it's a prebiotic and it's gonna help level out the sugar. It's just exquisite. <laughs> How many of you have cupboards at home like that? Do you? I know you do. We call it the supplement graveyard. One of the biggest tragedies of human civilization is the precedence of chemical therapy over nutrition. It's the substitution of artificial therapy over natural, poisons over food, so we're feeding people poison and trying to correct their starvation symptoms. People will ask you, what do you take? Can you look at what I'm taking? This always happens two minutes before the visit ends, doesn't it? Have you heard of blank? There's literally 29,000 products on the market, but you're supposed to know all of them. It's impossible. I say, send me a link and I'll read it. I'm selling CBD, it's multi-level. No, get out of my office. I don't feel any different on what I've been taking for years because it doesn't work or you built up a tolerance to it. 
And then why do we even need supplements? Well, we know about the soil and all of that. This is what your patients are going to be depleted in. I don't care what they're eating. Zinc, magnesium, Bs, fats, and minerals. If you have a patient that's on maintenance and they're doing great and they don't know what they should stay on, these are the things they should stay on right now. Okay? We don't want them to just survive. We want them to thrive. We have to change the cellular health at that level. What does it need? Oxygen, micronutrients, and water. Okay? Don't let them drink water with food. Here's about vitamin C and all these things that are important because we have to have C. We have to because it's water soluble. Okay? And vitamin D. So this is why people tell me on enough vitamin D, it's not that my joint pain is better, it's gone. That's what you want, okay? Immune systems will falter without vitamin D. Also, vitamin A, this is why kids get measles. Their vitamin A is low. And even a year later, they still have low vitamin A. Isn't that amazing? Look what low vitamin D can cause. Tension headaches, joint pain, irregular cycles, PMS, and absolutely those elevated thyroid antibodies and TSH. Absolutely. You can get rid of Hashi's people. It can happen. And here's the symptoms of problems with their gallbladder. But if you don't have enough stomach acid, your gallbladder is not going to be triggered to work. Liver and gallbladder support. Enzymes. Magnesium. Lovely, lovely, lovely. 90% oh, of Americans are low in magnesium. Calcium. And it has malic acid. This is excellent. Why is, why is this excellent? Malic acid softens gallstones. Yay. Multi-complex plus. It's got all this stuff in it. So if your patient says, I don't know what to take. See, look, this is what I like. No copper and no iron in it. Amino iron, okay, high absorption rate. Most women are anemic and their doctor says, your hemoglobin and manic are fine. Yeah, well, did they run a ferritin? No. Adrenal complete. There's balancing those catecholamines again. Probalance, look at all these goodies in here. Vitex is chase tree, black cohosh, dim, and it's putting the, cap the estrogen into the right pathway. The 2-methoxy instead of the 16. All these goodies in here. Look at all these things. Okay, it's time for Dr. Sedano first, and then we can have questions or whatever you want to do. And oh, how did uh, that uh, go? Wonderful. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence. There are only a few questions, but I think we do want to throw that over to Dr. Sedano. Uh, I just wanted to mention on here, it's always a wonderful to listen to you and your sense of humor. That's just a comment uh, on there. But let's turn, uh, again, no surprise. Uh, we've so enjoyed you this whole year. Um, Dr. Sedano, what are some Evexia tests or panels that you highly suggest for, uh, for inflammation? Yeah, thanks so much, Joanne. Doc, what a wonderful presentation. I know we can talk about inflammation pretty much all night long. I just want to just briefly touch on something. This is about 30 seconds, so everybody hang in there if, if you could. Um, some of the things that Doc mentioned, just to tie everything together, when you're, first of all, make sure that you're taking a really good patient history. It is so important. What I'm talking about yes. is history, emotional history, environmental, toxin exposure history, do your vitals, GI history, make sure you get that information. That will set the path on where you need to do your laboratory tests, um, what type of uh, even treatment can even be pulled off of that once you tie all that together. So that's important. Again, you're looking for, is there environmental toxin exposure? This is all related to inflammation. Is there tissue injury, chronic infection, allergens, oxidative stress? because that all causes inflammation. Now, if you have a patient that is known to have inflammation for many, many years, one thing that shows up most of the time is what's known as anemia of chronic inflammation. This is yes. where blood testing is extremely important, particularly looking at iron levels, because iron will be sequestered in these individuals and they will be anemic. And if your patient is anemic, guess what? A, a whole bunch of everything is not working properly because the, the red blood cells are not delivering the oxygen and what they need to do. So this is where the laboratory testing comes in. The Avexia wellness panels, the diabetes panel, the diabetic panel is important. 
Now to switch over, and I Doc mentioned it before, we offer a test called the the fatty acid erythrocyte test. That is our that is offered by our by our doctor's data, our lab partner. Something that you may or may not know is that lipids. I'm going to say it slowly now. Lipids have antimicrobial properties, to, to, and they are lauric acid is one of them. It's important to know what is the oil content, the essential fatty acid, the omega threes and omega sixes. How are you going to know that? Well, the erythrocyte test looks at the fatty, the fatty acid, the fatty acids in the in the red blood cell membrane, and that is going to be your starting base on what you need to replenish or not. You can get some details on Doc mentioned the uh, delta six, delta five to saturase, and what's going on there. Very important. With regard to inflammation, Avexia also offers a test called the cytodetox, DX test, excuse me, and that is a cytokine and response profile. That is going to look at your inter interleukin-6 and other interleukins to see, is that patient inflamed? And by the way, you can do that test after treatment, you know, a month or two later, maybe eight weeks later, and say, hey, are we changing the expression of these cytokines? Are we getting more into a, uh, a balanced immune response instead of an inflamed response. So these are some of the things that the please keep in mind. Uh, the last is thinking about food. Doc mentioned uh, food inflammation. Food can cause inflammation, food uh, allergies, food sensitivities. Our, we offer uh, many, many tests. Uh, KBO, our FIT test, uh, very, very great test. There are so many, and it has a gut health panel associated with that as well. Thanks for hanging in there. Doc, I'm going to turn it back, or Joanne, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, Thank Joanne, you, you go ahead and wrap it up. I, I don't think I had anything else to say. I think I've Okay. Them. You know what, uh, Dr. Lawrence, I'll just throw out one or two more questions, and we'll just wrap that up, and then anything else that isn't answered. There's been a lot of people that have uh, just asked for the replay and the slide that will definitely be provided to you uh, either tomorrow or by Monday. Uh, Chris will get that out to you. Uh, how about just one or two more questions? What would you do for high EPA? Okay, high EPA is usually due to an imbalance in the EPA DHA ratio. So I would increase DHA and or test for the uh, the omega sixes because, like I said, if there's too much of that being consumed and the body isn't utilizing it, it's because it's out of balance with the omega the omega sixes. Um, great. Um, let's just go to the, we'll just finalize. There's only like two other uh, questions and they may be more specific for you. So we'll circle around for those other uh, clinicians on uh, and get those uh, questions answered for you. Um, is there a next slide that just kind of finalizes our evening? Uh, but just wanted to mention, ask the doctor any help with lab interpretation, questions on clinical conditions, on your portal. Uh, of course, all of you know Dr. Wayne Sedano, a great resource. Uh, we have a free uh, email consultation, or you can sign up, uh, sign up for a live um, a meeting with him just to go over interpretation and questions. So that is available uh, for our practitioners. And next. And really just how to either order individual testing or lab partners. We walked it through a couple different uh, scenarios. These can be ordered through specialty labs with doctor's data. A lot of this is through LabCorp. So how to order anything, um, log into your Vexia account. Uh, you'll register your client or patient. You'll add a new lab order and then either uh, find the selected test from LabCorp unless it's going to be a specialty lab uh, and just preview your order and go ahead and check out and that'll finalize the order. And then lastly, I think just all the ways to reach us, we're here 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Info at Avexia Diagnostics, always available during those uh, hours. Uh, everybody has live chat right on their account. And if there's anything we can personally help you with at any time, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to us. So I guess that is going to conclude our final year with Gene Lawrence in December. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, for the uh, for any of the Avexia nutraceuticals mentioned, you can find those in the Avexia store uh, right from the top menu on your Avexia account, and then you can go ahead and add the products, find out all the information, um, and then just add them to your cart and complete your order. Again, we'll help with any questions. Um, it's just that simple. Um, so you can always reach us at Avexia. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence and Dr. Sedano for this informative presentation. As always, a recording of this webinar will be available by email in the next few 
days. Thank you again for joining us for this webinar event. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics, stay healthy, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.